Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bill McLeod, and this afternoon I'm going to introduce two people to you. The first is, of course, Dr. Ron Ronald Lang, who will need no introduction to you, although perhaps a personal reminiscence that in 1955, while I was a philosophy student, I read Dr. Lang's The Divided Self and was so inspired that I went to do medicine in order to do psychiatry. So that you've had a very profound influence on my life, sir. Uh, Dr. Lang has agreed to interview someone and uh, we have somebody who is very graciously, or two people who very graciously agreed to be interviewed and they will be seen in a small room at the back of this uh, building behind that is in order to preserve their uh, confidentiality. And uh, on my left is Ms. Lynn Liebling, a social worker at the Maricopa Medical Center. And the medical center is known as the Medical Center County Homeless Alternative Psychiatric Services Center, known as CHAPS for short. And in the English-speaking world, of course, CHAPS means something quite different to what it means to you. So we're going to be seeing at least one chap and one lady, I think, when Dr. Lang leaves the stage in a moment. And Ms. Liebling will uh, give a brief resume of the presentation in order to put it into context so that it's not completely out of the blue for you. So Dr. Lang, would you like to go now or would you have Ms. Liebling speak first? I guess I am. <laughs> Just a minute. I, <clears throat> uh, Ms. Liebling will uh, say a few words while I leave the stage and uh, join the company in the uh, room back there. Um, a further part of the plan is that uh, this interview will go on until about 20 to 2, uh, or quarter to 2, in other words, about half an hour. And then I'll come back and I'll be joined by uh, uh, Michael and Randy, who are sitting uh, here, whom Lynn will introduce to you. Um, and the four of us will then uh, take questions. I've met uh, the lady uh, whom I'll be talking with uh, for about 10 minutes. I met uh, her uh, last night for the first time. We just said hello and she agreed to uh, do this. And I met her uh, for a few minutes just now um, from the center to here. So uh, we've had no uh, conversation at all about her life, about herself, about her situation. And um, it, it's entirely by ear what you'll be seeing happening. Lynn. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know I was going to do this until 10 minutes ago. Um, so let me just lay out that CHAPS is a program which the county has set up for the homeless who have been labeled uh, mentally ill. I work in the county psychiatric annex, which is the voluntary and involuntary uh, treatment facility. At one point, um, it was noticed that certain people, that the major treatment there is through uh, drugs and chemicals. Um, it was noticed that some people didn't want to take this kind of treatment and were labeled treatment resistant. In order to seduce them into the, um, into the scheme of things, a um, treatment resistant facility was set up near St. Vincent de Paul, which is downtown near where the homeless people are. And um, case managers and doctors uh, stay there and give help for people that want it. Um, and help facilitate them kind of negotiate uh, through their life in the city of Phoenix. Uh, the two people that are going to be interviewed by Dr. Lang are people that um, are involved in the CHAPS program and, you know, are sometimes homeless and are, quote, treatment resistant. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. At 20 to 2, I'd like to introduce them now, if you'd stand up and then come up to the stage later on. Dr. Michael Stumpf and Mr. Randy Park, the case manager from the hospital, who'll be joining us, as I said, at 20 to 2. So thank you both for being here. So, should we start? Yeah. I can't hear you. Ready to go, sir. 
You can't hear me. I can hear you now. Oh. Yes. It says he says when you when you try to torture him, he's gonna get a par parachute and bail out. Mm-hmm. To the nether regions. Huh? <laughs> to the upper regions. To the what? To the nether or upper regions. Anyway, we are. Uh, I don't know anything about you at all. Uh, and I don't know what uh, to ask you about yourself. Yeah. <laughs> what do... What would you feel that... Uh, I don't know. Appropriate to say under the circumstances. I don't know. <laughs> Is there anything that... Uh, and do you feel that your situation is okay for you just now, or... Uh, you're, say, you're telling me, uh, coming over, you're taking some Nux Vomica to yeah. calm your yeah. system uh, down. And to sharpen my stupid wits. Yeah. What is it, uh, what is it that's uh, creating the static in your system, the disturbance in your system? Oh, um, I think my brain doesn't work right. In what way? Oh, let me see. Well, I get, I get, the next vomit I doesn't treat this per se. I'm getting another remedy for that. Well, I get things turned around. I get opposites confused. I get, my, I, when I write, I get my letters confused. I get words confused. And, uh, either I tend to be paranoid or, or they really are after me. I don't know which. So you're not sure whether you're confused about that or not. Uh, about what? About whether they really are after you or not. Uh. Well, he sounds like it. What, him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might be after me for all I know. Oh, I'm just trying to help you guys um, get some sense into your brains. I don't know if it's worth it, though. You know, <clears throat> I, I had a guru for a long time who said, there, there isn't any sense in it. What you got to do to to be able to perceive reality is attain a level of consciousness which he offered, which I never attained, which is, he said, beyond the mind. It's completely above the mind. What sort of guru is this, Carter? This, this is Guru Maharaji. Ah. Well, what do you take him to mean by that? beyond the mind or above the mind? Well, whatever it is, I couldn't imagine with my mind, because it's beyond the mind. Or I suppose it's some sort of, I suppose it involves a universal, being conscious of the universal consciousness. You know, everybody is subconsciously aware of um, everybody else's mind. Well, you know that, I've seen that. I've seen you read my mind. I don't see how you can be conscious of the universal mind. The universal mind's conscious of you, but you're not conscious of oh, it. I, well, maybe so. <laughs> you maybe may go. so. I mean, yeah, maybe out of my bitterness, I just say, well, the universal mind, you know, doesn't know anything. <laughs> I mean, maybe I say that because, because um, I look around and, and I, don't see, I don't see any superior intelligence taking care of anything. How would you expect to see a... You mean all the pain and suffering, stupidity and confusion in the world? How can there be a universal mind if a universal mind allows that sort of stuff to go on? Yeah, especially stupidity. Ah. So either the, maybe the, either the universal mind is uh, stupid itself 
or it's made itself, or it doesn't exist. Oh, it exists. It might be just some total of human minds, but it, it exists. Well, are you trying to... Well, I mean, I've spent a lot of time trying to work out uh, how that can uh, be the case, if it is the case. But I haven't found any answer to that myself. But I, I still put a collar and tie on under the circumstances. Why not? Yeah. I asked him why he didn't kill himself and he says you're not ready yet. Well, I guess if you're dead, you blow any chance of me um, doing anything good, huh? This time round. Hmm? This time round, anyway. If we were just sitting here without these uh, uh, cameras on us and these microphones, I wouldn't say anything just now, but uh, I feel impelled to uh, uh, make an effort to keep talking for the sake of uh, people who are listening to it. Maybe it shouldn't bother. Are people listening to this? Yeah. A lot of people listening to this. That's why the... Mm -hmm. uh, Wait, nobody told me the the, 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 the cameras is on. The cameras, uh, that guy's got the, as far as I know, he's got the camera uh, on just now. And there are a whole lot of people listening to it. Jeez, I want to talk about that stuff. Of that. Right. I don't know it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been in Phoenix, then? A year and a half. And what brought you to Phoenix? I was trying to escape the conspiracy, and it didn't work. And what conspiracy? Well, if there is one, I suppose you're a conspirator, so you know already. If there isn't, I guess I just imagined it. Well, uh, whether or not I'm a conspirator, and whether or not you're imagining it, are you prepared to uh, 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 give me your account of what that conspiracy is? As much as I can figure out, yeah. No, oh, well, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I think your conspiracy doesn't exist, so I just don't think about it. <clears throat> if I don't think about it, it's not there too much. But then people like Peter, people like Dr. Stump, you know, they tend to make me believe in it again. So, so I try to avoid those people. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. No, he's all right when he talks about the job. <laughs> is it a benign conspiracy or a malign hmm? conspiracy? Is it? Huh? Well, is it a conspiracy for good oh, or for evil? I know, but if anybody messes with me like that, I don't care. But you know what I figure is. Um, You see, the mind creates a whole lot of things, you know. I mean, I see mind as really powerful. And, and people, subconsciously, their minds always interact. They do, I've seen that, yeah. you know. And um, people see what they expect to see. So it stands to reason, if I believe in a conspiracy, people are going to act like conspirators. No? So far, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I told Dr. Stump, he walked into <clears throat> the room just as I was saying something negative about doctors. <laughs> <laughs> but he denied that he heard it. Well, who walked in the room? Peter? Huh? 
Huh? Just who, who walked in the room just as when you were saying something? Dr. Stumpf. Uh-huh. But I don't know. Maybe I expected him to walk in when I said something negative about doctors. I mean, they try. <laughs> Well, that sort of thing happens. It's happening all the time. I mean, I don't. I. 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 I mean, I don't see what making a special point of that. But what do you mean? I don't see why you are making a special point of telling me that uh, uh, just now, since that sort of thing, as you know, I know and. I know you know it happens all the time anyway. Yeah. Because well, cause they're watching us. Oh, yeah, all right, we've got to stop that. <laughs> well, I mean, this whole sit -up, set up is an enormous conspiracy. I mean, you're right in the right in the heart of the conspiracy just now. Mm. So it, you have <laughs> if you if you if you came to Phoenix to get away from the conspiracy, you haven't done very well. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, you're sitting here <laughs> in this situation. You mean the conference is a conspiracy? Yeah, of course. What kind of a conspiracy? Uh, well, I've got a, I've got a plane booked uh, to get to Boston on Sunday, so I'm not going to say what sort of conspiracy is because I want to go on that plane, you know, in good order, as far as I'm concerned. No, I think it's quite a benign conspiracy. It's certainly a very concerted, deep plan. And it involves uh, it's much wider than the number of people who are actually here. Seven thousand people mm. have flown in, uh, and that's a sort of minor conspiracy in terms of the galaxy, but it's quite a big conspiracy. Oh. Well, how do you know about it? Hmm? How do you know about it? Well, I think it's a, a... I think the universal mind is, is has been asleep a bit. Uh, as far as this planet goes, I mean, in this galaxy, uh, 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 and this uh, planet, it's 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 uh, it's sort of itching a bit, and it's sort of waking up a bit and sort of doing something about it. Now. Through it is capable of doing anything. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, Jesus Christ has got no other hands but ours. Oh. It's only capable of doing what we do. I mean, as far as we're concerned. Are you a Christian? Well, it depends who I'm talking to. <laughs> well, just tell me... Uh, if I'm talking to you? Well, uh, I'm not sure what I should say about that. Uh, uh, I, I'm a Christian in the sense that Jesus Christ wasn't uh, crucified, isn't, wasn't crucified between two candlesticks in a cathedral. He was crucified in the town garbage heap between two thieves. In that sense, I'm a Christian. You're what? Huh? I didn't hear your last word. In that sense, I'm a Christian. But I mean, in another uh, in another sense, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't admit to being a, a Christian in most Christian company. Right, well, you're a Christian. Hell no. Hmm. Hmm. I don't think so. Um, I think I think God doesn't know what He's doing. So. Um, who knows? Maybe Jesus. Maybe Jesus had a mental problem. You know. 
Well, I, 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 maybe he didn't have time to mature. They got him too young. Huh? <laughs> or maybe... I was talking to my friend about this the other day. I told him I don't believe in God. And he says he believes in many gods. And, and they eat their disciples after they die. So maybe that, maybe that's what Jesus does. Well, uh, uh, worse things could happen, and uh, if when I die I was, I was eaten up by Jesus, <laughs> sounds quite a good gospel hymn. You think it would be okay? <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought it might be better than getting eaten by the devil. It might be, indeed. But then, it might be better not to get eaten at all. I don't think you can help it. Excuse me? I don't think you can help it. Uh, uh, I mean, we're, uh, we're, either, we're either in the bowels of hell or in the bowels of heaven, or both at one time. The what? The bowels. Bowels? Bowels. Oh. Mm. <coughs> yeah. But I think that's awfully mean. But then, that's just what my friend said. It doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it's not fair? You say it's awfully mean. I think it's awfully mean that humans are at the consciousness we're at. We're just, we're just half, just halfway someplace. We're, we're intelligent, but we're not intelligent enough. At least I haven't figured anything out. Have you? You're older. What difference does that make? Well, you've had more time. <coughs> Have you figured anything out? You don't get any wiser when you get older. See? You're laughing. I got a laugh. What about your, um, mum and dad and that sort of thing? What sort of... Are they alive or...? Who, my parents? Yeah. Yeah. What sort of chap was your father? Was your father? Oh, well, uh, he's a Christian preacher. Yes. Oh, hi. I ought to have known him. <laughs> yeah, my parents are very religious. Mm -hmm. At least they say they are. Well, you're very religious. You know what, my... Yeah, I guess... Oh, I it's mean. not meant as an insult. Right? And my parents run, are currently are running a shelter up in Michigan. What? They are running a shelter. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Where is that? Saginaw. How do they feel about you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> mm. I don't know. Um, I wrote them. I don't know. I wrote them a letter, and asked them. And I haven't picked it up in the mail yet. I asked them uh, if if it was okay for me to send a Christmas present. <laughs> That's. I don't know. No reply. I haven't been to the post office yet to pick it up, to if they did reply. I mean, I suppose they probably did. Do you expect them to send you a Christmas present? Oh, God. I don't know. But see, I was... <coughs> I had some Christmas gifts, so I thought I'd send them some. 
Because I was making crafts for Christmas. Because you're making... Crafts? Crafts. Yeah. Uh -huh. I would never have thought of uh, sending, writing my parents and asking them if it was okay for me to send them a present for Christmas. And uh, why wouldn't it be okay? Well, because maybe they hate me after all. I, after being an unfaithful daughter. Well, unfaithful to. Yes. Mm. I haven't visited them in years. <laughs> mm. And in fact, and I don't communicate well, well with them either. But you see, I have my own life to live. Uh, you know, I hope they understand that, but maybe they don't. Well, if you're faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, how can yeah. you be unfaithful to your father? I mean, he said, uh, didn't he, I, I, unless you hate your father and mother and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Yeah. What does your Maybe. father make of that? Well, probably that um, all this cr Christian emphasis on family is, a, is, a, is against the teachings of Jesus. You know, the modern, the modern Christian emphasis on families. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I, I, do you know that passage uh, where, where Jesus? Uh, I, I always uh, uh, thought there was something wrong with that translation. It said, in the, in the, said "Unless you, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, unless you hate your father and mother and brothers and sisters, also said, said you cannot be my disciple." In the English version, mm. I, I think it means unless you prefer me to your father. And I don't recall that he's that it said hate. Hmm. It's uh, something like deny. Yeah, I, I asked a guy, uh, uh, an uh, Aramaic uh, scholar about that, he said he, he, he thought it meant unless you are happily indifferent to them. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. I call his bluff. Because if you're not happily indifferent to your parents, they're going to be on your case all your life. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> mm. I have to go back now. I'm going to get up on stage and talk okay. about it. Is that right? Okay. Right. I'll see you later. Mm. Okay. Mm. Hey, can I come out? Do you want to come out? See what you say, yeah. Perhaps I could ask if any of the panel would like to make a comment before we go for questions and answers from the uh, and comments from the audience. How is that for you now that you've seen that there is a large group of people here? Thank you for your graciousness and being here, by the way. Oh, they're, they're very nice to clap. They're very nice to clap for us. It's an acknowledgement of your courage. So thank you. Would you like to make any comment? No. 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 Just go for Right. So we'll take questions from the, from the audience. Uh, if anybody would like to come up and address a question to a member of the panel. You want to take an interval? You want to take a stretch? No? Yes, here's a question here. Thank you. Well, I'm only getting up because no one else did. And I want to tell you that my impression was that our young lady is extremely bright. And I'd like you to know from, from my point of view that one of the reasons I'm at this conference 
is to answer some of the questions about life that you're looking at through your eyes. And uh, appreciate you being up there. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I was wondering what you thought really went on therapeutically in that uh, interview. You're addressing that to Dr. Lang? Yeah. What do you think went on therapeutically? I'm, I'm mystified, to tell you the truth. So maybe you could explain it to me. If you're mystified, I can't explain it to you. <laughs> Did anything go on? <laughs> There's an observation perhaps you could make as to who's up on the platform which might partly answer your question. Yes. Um, a couple of days ago, Dr. Lang, uh, you spoke about creating a kind of transpersonal reality, or not creating, but stepping into something that is a shared reality between you and the person you're working with. And that spoke to me very deeply. Um, and I, I was really interested in, in hearing from the young woman that you've been interviewing with, and also from you, about the experience of that, that moving into that place. Um, you, and I'm speaking to, to you, the young woman, mentioned um, some feeling of uh, Dr. Lang having read your mind earlier. And it, I'd, I'd like to hear anything you have to say about that experience, either as something as his stepping into your your head, or the two of you being in some kind of shared reality. Neither of us know how to answer that question. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'll have a sort of uh, uh, putting a few words uh, uh, to this and uh, tell me if I strike a wrong note. Uh, <clears throat> It's with the greatest uh, reservations that uh, I think one can talk about transpersonal reality. It is certainly non-verbal and it is uh, fundamentally, essentially impossible to express in the content of words. It is possible to convey it, however, more in the through words, th through, in, in the music of words, in the manner of words, and in the uh, other ways in which I was trying to uh, explain two days ago, we communicate with each other interpersonally. Uh, if that realization uh, is present, of uh, the transpersonal field, then nothing needs to be said uh, between those people who are aware of that transpersonal field. When one tries to explain one's awareness of that transpersonal field to people who are not aware of it, and I know that in this company, there are a lot of you who are aware of it, and many of you who are not aware of it. Now, to those of you who are aware of it, you know how difficult it is to talk about it. And to those of, uh, those of you who are not aware of it, I would say this, don't 
be too impatient. Don't, because you don't understand it, because you are mystified, don't get angry. Something is happening. Something is happening. Something is happening between us in this uh, hall at this very moment. We can't express it in words. There is a conspiracy. There is a divine conspiracy which has brought us together. There is a divine conspiracy as well as the conspiracy of the devil. Uh, I'm not going to just go on <clears throat> and uh, uh, say any more about uh, 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 that just now, but uh, it, uh, I, as I was tried to uh, say before, it makes all the difference if there is a uh, if there is a sense of communion, which is unspoken, uh, it doesn't have to be said. It shouldn't actually be spoken about any more than it uh, sometimes needs to be. Out of which interpersonal communication occurs and which links up with the intrapersonal. If that is there, it makes all the difference. If that is absent, it's sort of going at it uh, like this, making interpretations, trying to understand, trying to do psychotherapy, I was saying whether it's behavioral therapy, psychotherapy, psychoanalytic therapy, or whatnot, etc., it will come to nothing. It, it's all, it, doesn't, it doesn't get anywhere with those people, those people who uh, find it very difficult to live in a the world of the interpersonal and the intrapersonal and can see wh how stupid it all is, how ugly it all is, how inexpressibly confused it all is. And yet, um, uh, I just regard it as crazy and mad for realizing that. And either locked up or run away. Speaking about conspiracy, I'd like to ask the members of the panel how this young woman came to be interviewed in front of hundreds or thousands of us today without knowing that this was the case. I knew it. I knew it was the case. She knew it oh, was the case. She, did. didn't, she didn't know that. She didn't know that we that the the, 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 the camera started running. I see. That's all. Oh, she knew absolutely it was the case. You know? What? You knew it was the case. Yeah, I knew you guys were watching. You knew we were watching. I, I didn't know it. when they started the cameras. I got it. <laughs> Thank. Yes. Thank you. It seems to me that what seems to be happening is that a vacuum has been created. It reminds me of a professor friend of mine who said, I feel, I feel, I don't know what I feel, but oh, how I feel. And uh, what I'm wondering is, that vacuum allows people in the medical professions to bring zombies to us, and we have to work with them. And uh, the vacuum doesn't really uh, give to me, at least, a feeling of understanding. And when you refuse to understand, refuse, it, it sounds sort of nirvanish. And uh, although I'm not against that, I, I think that some kind of clearer explanation clearer understanding should be given so we know what we're doing. And when you avoid those things, you're, you're breaking down the whole therapeutic process, it would seem to me. Enlightenment does not come just by remaining silent, although that's a nice feeling. This uh, young lady sitting beside me <coughs> is supposed to be an absolute paranoid schizophrenic on medication. She's sitting here just now, perfectly compass mentis, perfectly clear, facing this most intimidating situation from the stage, not exhibiting any symptoms of schizophrenic uh, 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 disorder, 
If you knew of any uh, medication that could do that in 20 minutes, from there to here, would you say you wouldn't uh, give that to a patient? Uh, you would have to spend the rest of your life being a biochemist to understand what the chemical effects of that sort of thing are supposed to be in the central nervous system. So you don't know anything about this sort of process. Have the humility to admit that and keep your place instead of the arrogance that you seem to have to think that you, uh, uh, because you don't know something, that, uh, uh, that there's something the matter with those people who do. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't say that I don't, I, I have a mind that can understand, I'm sure you do, uh, and I don't think we should call each other's names and, and say arrogance. I think there is more arrogance in silence sometimes than there is in expressing wisdom uh, if somebody has it. If there is wisdom, give it to us, but, but uh, don't let us feel as though there's some kind of a mystical communion going on when there isn't. And to there call is. It, there is. That's the point. There certainly is. But you, you see, usually some sort of mystical communion going on when there isn't. Well, again, it's I feel, I feel, you know, I don't you know, know I what feel, I feel. I feel, I feel, I feel. But I don't know what I feel, but oh, how I feel. I do know, and you don't know, and I'm saying it's not verbal, and it can't be put into words. And it, because you can't understand it, obviously, let's see. <laughs> because there's some sort of mystical communion going on. Uh, but there are people who have claimed to see the devil. There are people who have claimed to uh, all kinds of things. If it, if it bothers you, I can it quit. It bothers me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Since we have the doctors on the panel up there, I wonder if they would be willing to take this opportunity to talk about their own struggles with medicating the folks at CHAPS. I was over there last night and met them, and I'm sure that they do struggle with this. And those of us who work in a system struggle very much with the issue of medication, particularly around relief of pain as opposed to control of behavior. I'd just like to hear the doctors and other members of the panel address that directly. Dr. Stumpf. Thank you. That has been quite an issue within our program. Briefly, our, our program, CHAPS, County Homeless Alternative Psychiatric Services, is a storefront Bowery area clinic. Um, we're down there in between the, uh, the homeless shelter, the euphemistically labeled open air park, and the uh, plasma center. Our mandate, or what we're paid to do, is to locate homeless people who have been diagnosed chronically mentally ill, and of course those that pay us have a, a strict set of criteria as to what's to be considered chronically mentally ill and what is not. We're a voluntary program, and essentially we're a place for people to come when they have nowhere else to go. People are welcome to show up, have a, a sandwich, have a cup of coffee, watch the television, talk with people. One of our first goals is to find folks a decent place to live, make sure that they have somewhere they can get their three square meals a day, and address other concrete concerns, ongoing medical problems that need to be treated. Oftentimes we find just by removing people from the street environment and placing them somewhere stable, or helping them find somewhere stable to live, we see tremendous gains in terms of reduction of psychosis, um, diminution of symptoms, and people just generally get along much better. Um, for example, Lila, when I had first seen her, you mind me saying, was back in this summer. I saw her twice at the CHAP Center where she had come in. Um, I really can't say why the motivation. I imagine she had heard about us some from other people around. Is that right? Excuse me? How come you came to CHAPS, Lila, first time? Had you heard about us? You were referred. Oh, one of the guys at the shelter then saw her and said she might want to drop by. Um, we saw her once or twice, sat and talked. Um, and then I didn't see her again until last night when she fortuitously showed up. Um, I would posit, since when I saw Lila in the summer 
and she was doing quite poorly by, by my criteria in that she exhibited loose associations, prominent delusions, um, was visibly hallucinating and was disoriented. Um, and now, of course, she's much better, but I would posit that a, a great deal of that gain is not due so much to any other factor than that she now has a stable place to live. <laughs> I think one of the national shames within our society is that right here within our city, while we're sitting comfortably, there are over a thousand mentally ill persons who slept last night on the streets. You can't see it, Michael, but there's disagreement from this end of the table. Would you like yeah. to say something about that? It's not true for you. No, that, that's not why I'm doing better. Not why you're doing I better. Explained it, I explained it last night, if you remember. I do. Would you like to tell them? Go ahead. Oh, my God. Go yes. <laughs> the reason I'm doing better is because I quit putting mental energy into the... Into uh, the conspiracy and creating it to a certain point. But this guy says that there is one. <laughs> and what I was trying, and I think that's because you know how to share minds? Yeah. It's because he knows how to. It's because he knows how to tap into other people's minds. You know, on a subtle level, not by just asking questions. Because everybody reads minds. You, you guys read minds. I tell you, everybody does. And if, you, and if you observe, if you look around, you'll notice it. Thank you. And And I'd like to say something else while I, get, while I get this. I don't go around like a paranoid schizophrenic all the time. I know how to keep my cool. And, and I think this guy would be a great psychotherapist because, um, <laughs> because, because he does that, because, because he knows how to tap into, into other people's where other people's minds are at, you know, not by just asking questions and trying to figure things out like uh, some. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we have time for a few more questions, yes. Okay, just briefly, I'm having a real difficult time reading the doctor's mind at this point. I still don't feel that he addressed the issue of medication. You're probably right. I didn't go quite far enough. I do utilize medicines. Um, again, we're in voluntary program. I believe that a modern-day psychiatrist has to be well-versed in all types of therapies, including medical therapies, analytical therapies, other dynamic therapies, and lastly, social therapies. To do only one type of therapy for all types of patients is inappropriate. Some patients benefit from one approach, other patients benefit from another approach. When I feel patients can benefit from some sort of medication for symptom reduction, then I certainly offer it. We're a voluntary program, nobody takes anything that they don't want to take. But I do use medicines quite extensively. Sure. What I was told is that they are, are very strongly encouraged to take medication. That's what I was told by the social worker at CHAPS, that that is an agenda of the program. Um, at times, yeah. We don't twist people's arms and threaten to throw them out in the street. We provide services to folks whether or not they take medicines. Right. In you. general, the folks I see, they've been called chronic. Um, generally, they're going to have some sort of symptoms lifelong. I'm much more concerned that they come away with a good experience with their psychiatrist and grow to trust psychiatrists a bit more and be able to turn to us when they need to than I am in momentarily reducing symptoms with medication. However, medications can be literally life-saving when appropriately used. Thank you. I just wonder if there's anyone else on the panel who'd like to add to that, and I'm going to sit down. Good. Thank you. This is okay. on the lighter side, and it's for Dr. Lang and his friend on his Could left. Could you speak a little louder, please? Thank you. This is for Dr. Lang and his friend on his left. 
um, on Tuesday. I didn't get an opportunity to ask him, and I have a big need to ask him, if he is indeed conversant with the novelist Doris Lessing. I'm a fan of hers and a fan of his. I didn't get a chance to ask that question. Today, along comes this young woman who has a remarkable resemblance to Doris Lessing, physically, I see. And uh, I just want to say that I see that as sort of a synchronistic event. But it is still a question. Did you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, I I, I've met Doris Lessing, yes. Uh, uh, and uh, I've read uh, some of Doris uh, Lessing's uh, work. I very much had, uh, I very much had, of course, I very much admire her as a writer uh, and uh, like her as a person. I felt particularly in the Four Gated City, she was influenced by your work. If you remember that. Well, I, I, I think she has been. Uh, she certainly has said so in, okay. in, in writing. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, my question goes to uh, Dr. Lane and uh, the young lady. Uh, I would like you to tell me, all the people here at the same time, that how is it for you, young lady, I don't know your name, how is it for you to be here, there with us now? And for the Tallinn, uh, what does that mean to you? I hope you guys can learn something. That says it all, thank you. Yes. Uh, okay, I, I loved it. I thought it was wonderful. And I think that uh, you should learn something from Ronald, because I don't think you did. You see, what we had experienced here is a communion of love. Uh, what I was observing, and I fell in trance, I fell in love with this young person. And she was able to elicit from Ronald, and so did he from her, that kind of experiences. It was experienced at the level not of the words, but there was an element of joining that was expressed in their hands, in their legs, they were moving exactly in the same place, and I loved it. And I think it's important that you should know that. I am talking to the physician that talks about drugs, because the drug that existed there is very, very powerful. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mnuchin. Point of information. Uh, one more question, and then we'll leave may, it at that. May I, may I ask uh, a point of information? And I think only the young lady can answer this. You've been uh, introduced as one of the homeless, and you undoubtedly have met many others on the street. How many of you, if, and I don't know if it's fair for me to ask you to speak for others, but how many of you would choose to stay where you are if people would leave you alone? I, I, I'm asking this because it's somehow disturbing to many others to see somebody without a place. So they want to make a place for them. And what's more, they want to make a place for them for homeless people all together, you know, bunched. And I wonder if that's a good thing. The worst thing about being on the streets is feeling threatened by other people who, who try to do harm to street people. And it doesn't help, it doesn't help a person feel them less like people are out to get them either, you know? Thank you. May I answer to that question, please, before we I sign off? I'd like question. to, because it brings in with the last question about the power of love. I have yet to meet any of our clients on the street that enjoy being there. 
they're there because circumstances have forced them there. It, it is quite dangerous, it's quite uncomfortable. No one wants to be there. Most of our clients are unloved. Um, very few clients are articulate, attractive like Lila. Our more typical client is visibly disoriented, dressed inappropriately for weather, louse ridden, um, angry, hostile, making no sense when he talks. These people are not loved within our society, and I think that gives us something to think about. Good, thank you. If I could, uh, while I was listening to the questioning, I was thinking of some lines of uh, Dr. Lang's uh, poem, Knots, and the lines which occurred to me have a lot of irony in them, of course, but they apply to you and me, perhaps. They are playing a game. They are not playing a game. How dare you laugh when Christ died for you? And I saw a lot of laughter, and as Dr. Mnuchin said, the contact between the two, I think, was an expression of the playfulness which can occur even when discussing subjects such as that. I'd like you to join with me in thanking the whole panel and uh, particularly the main speakers.